soon as we're on, I'll introduce you. All right, so now we're joined by so now we're joined by John Lisbon, who's running for City Council District 6. So go ahead with the two-minute introduction. Hi, I'm yes, I'm John Lisbon. I'm running for City Council District 6. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a neighbor, actually, live up the street right here in um, Sunset Hill. And I, we've been living here for 17 years, my family and I. I'm not a politician. I'm um, not a community activist, or I haven't been involved in government. I've been involved in building a business for the last 17 years. I'm sorry, 13 years. And um, that company has been kind of a rocket ship. It's grown to be one of uh, Washington's fastest growing private companies for the last four years. So that's been my focus, but I also have a passion for uh, politics and over the last five years, I've been kind of gravitating towards that. I've built a leadership team so I can move out of the operational role of the company. And I recently uh, completed my degree at the University of Washington Evans School of Public Affairs. And it's an executive master's of public administration. So that brings me here as um, a non-politician, somebody who is going to run for office with a entrepreneurial mindset. Great, so now we have our four prepared questions. We're asking all candidates, and we went from that order last time. And feel free to turn the paper over right in front of you. Um, that one right there, you can read along as we read them aloud. These are two minute answers, and Michael, will you do number one? Seattle is experiencing a housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, subsidized housing, and rent control, among others. What is your approach to keeping Seattle affordable? Well, first of all, um, yeah, I know it's, it's a, a huge issue in Seattle and, of course, in, in Ballard and the suburban village that we have. Um, personally, I think that I'm really, I like all of these ideas. I like the these. Um, I even might support rent control, but I know that's kind of a waste of time right now with the Republican with the Senate. So, um, I'm more of an all of the above policy. And my approach is, is really about listening to the community and listening to my advisors. I'm a, like I said, I was a business person. I don't have all the ideas. That's why we have committees, and that's why we have um, you know, blue ribbon panels. And that, that's how I would take an approach, where I would listen to my advisors and come up with the best policies. Uh, Joseph, number two. Last year, voters approved the levy to fund a universal preschool pilot program. After the pilot concludes, how would you fund the full implementation of the program, and what policy changes would you make to assure this plan addresses educational disparities in our city? That's a good question. Um, I have a child who's going to school. He's not in the preschool program. He's past that now. <coughs> I believe you know preschool is the most important time for education and for learning. And I understand it's a pilot program. At this point, I can't tell you how I would fund it, but I think that it's not just important that we fund education for preschool. We need to fund education for all kids. My kid goes to uh, a school right here, and he's with 29 other students. So I don't think there's really an opportunity for him to get a good education either. So I think the pilot program is great. I think we need to help our children, um, you know, get more attention too. If we're lucky, we can afford to have a tutor for our kid. But uh, what about you know working women and who can't? So I think every kid should have the opportunity to get a good education. Great, Janet, number three. Okay. Sarah, number three. Bertha is still stuck. What options does the city of Seattle have with respect to potential cost overruns, the waterfront, transit, and an unsafe buyout? Well, okay, so I guess what I didn't tell you is when I started, um, 
any interest or a bug for politics, it was with the monorail. And I think we wouldn't have to be dealing with this <coughs> if that actually went through. It would have been pretty cool. Um, as far as the policy itself, I don't think I have enough familiarity with the issues to answer that um, question specifically at this point. Um, I do know that we need the transportation issues in um, Seattle are serious issues all around, it's not just the viaduct, but um, you know, getting downtown. Again, this is a district race. What I'm doing is not only representing the city, but I'm representing our district right here. And what I hear from the constituents here is they can't even get across town, not let alone downtown. And you know, we definitely need light rail in this district eventually, but that's going to come. That's going to take time for that to happen. So in the meantime, I think there are major things that we have. There are minor things that we have to do to protect, um, you know, so we can have safety for our kids, so they can walk across the street, so we can get downtown, so we're not stuck in traffic. Because I work downtown too. So there are lots of alternatives besides what's going down with Bertha. Would I do I still support it? Yes, I do. I think we have to complete it once we start it. We have to complete it. We have to stay the course. Great. Let's go to number four. Seattle is the fastest growing city in the country. Should we encourage or discourage this growth? And what policy changes are necessary to accommodate the growth? Well, as you know, I'm, like I said, I've worked in a business that's a very fast growing uh, organization as well. And I, I encourage the growth. I, I live in that. I love um, growth, and I think Seattle is definitely benefiting from the growth. The problem is that we're not um, we're not dealing with the growth issues and the issues that come. Most of the issues that are we're dealing with today are due to that growth, <coughs> and um, so there are a plethora of, <coughs> of issues. Whether it's you know housing affordability, um, transportation. Just the general livability density in this neighborhood. It's all coming from that growth. And it's all, you know, so this is the root core, you know, core um, issue that we're all facing right now. Because there's really, um, you know, as the fastest growing city in the nation, it's, you know, I think the government has been reactive instead of proactive at this point. And we have to become reactive and we have to make some changes now. We have great long-term planning, and I agree with it. We have to take the incremental steps right now um, that that are affecting us sitting and stewing in traffic, trying to get through to Burke Gilman, uh, trying to ride your bikes across Ballard Bridge. I mean, that's dangerous. I mean, the missing link is still missing. It's 20 years now. I mean, I've been here. And it's still missing, and, and we're doing another study. So I think there's things we can do that will improve that situation and can show that government can be responsive quickly and cheaply. Great. So now we'll open it up to follow-up questions. Um, these are one-minute answers. I have one, then Joseph, and then Mary and Michael. So uh, I asked this question and have for years of all challengers to incumbents. So you're running against someone who's currently on city council, although it's a new district. Um, and no one's entitled to any particular seat, but uh, is there a particular reason why Michael Bryan should no longer be on the city council? Um, I would just say that I think a lot of his policies, I can't I honestly say I don't agree with a lot of his policies. I think what's more important implementing those policies and having more of a data-driven government and a, a data, you know, using that data to make changes. We, uh, you know, as government, we're not moving fast enough. Like I said, we're reactive. We're not proactive. If you want more of the same, then keep Michael Ryan in office. If you want to make more, somebody who's grown a business, somebody who knows business, 
somebody who knows how to grow an organization, a leadership team, who knows how to make changes, then maybe you want to vote for me. Okay, Joseph, then Mary. So you talk about your background in business and the skills and lessons that you've learned from that, and you know, ostensibly transferring those to public office. So if you were elected from a managerial perspective, <coughs> governance perspective, which skills wouldn't transfer? Which skills are unique to public office that you don't have? That's a great question. Um, I think that's one of the things I've learned from going to Devon School, that I can't come in as that private sector guy. I know there's a lot of constraints in government, and I'm, you know, ultimately, you know, I'm very aware of that. So I'm going to have to work within those constraints of government, and it's not going to be easy, and I know that. But I think it, you know, it's a combination of my public sector learning and my private sector skills. But I don't want to, you know, again, I don't want to come in like a bull in a china shop. Great. Mary, then Michael, and Clayton. You describe yourself as an entrepreneur and you're running against one of the two city council people that is best known as a progressive. And I wonder if as well as being an entrepreneur, do you view yourself as a progressive in any way? If you do, why and if not, why not? Um, well, I do, um, yes. I don't actually feel like I fit in with all the entrepreneurs that I know. Um, I was a member of the entrepreneur organization here in Seattle. And I loved it because I didn't feel I had the same values as a lot of people. Um, my values are much more progressive. <coughs> and my, I guess that the values were you know, from my mom, and who was, a, you know, was president of the borough when she was younger and really cared about people. And um, those who didn't have, weren't as fortunate as, as us. And I think she should instill those values in me, and I am what I am. So I'm not your typical business person. In fact, I, I don't like the label that business people have, so that's why I'm becoming a politician. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we'll go to law school. <laughs> cool. So, uh, Michael and then Clayton. Um, so, could you tell us more about your business career and your company specifically, and how that has prepared you for a role in the city council? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Um, the company is called Point It. It's a digital marketing company. I started it as a sole proprietor. We now have about 40 people, and it's we're on Denny and Western downtown. I had an original partner, and about five or six years ago, we separated, and now um, I brought in a, another president. We've grown a leadership team. Our executive team is mostly women. Um, they're highly compensated, so I think when it comes to pay equity, I can stand behind that. And they're great because we've been able, you know, we've been able to offer them flexibility they need to work in the workplace. It's one thing we did. We just built a great culture, and um, and it hasn't been one major policy. We've been adding things one at a time, new policies incrementally, and over time we built it to such a point where we can't get rid of people. So it's it's you know that's that's my experience. And like I said, oh, my time's up. <laughs> so, uh, Clayton, then John. Mike will beat me to it. All right. Uh, John, go ahead. Okay. Uh, of the current city and city council members, who do you think most uh, aligns with your thinking? If any. Or who do you who do you I think, I think, I think they are, I can't. I can't name anyone, like, who do I want? Or who do you respect the most? Well, I certainly don't want to say Suman, it's <laughs> but um, I do respect her in that she's really, um, you know, I, I love her passion and um, how she connects with 
with the constituents. And, um, I'm not a socialist and I don't believe in that, but I do understand that there is a huge income disparity right now in this country, the worst it's ever been. And even as an entrepreneur, I think, yes, the rich should be, the super wealthy should be taxed more. And, there, and what is missing in this country is a middle class, and we're losing the middle class. And that's what we have to build up. Um, not only, you know, it, it's good for everybody. It's good for the businesses downtown if you have a middle class. <coughs> and it's good for the middle class. But one thing I can say is I, I, I visited Japan, and it just seems like there's a bigger middle class. And the people there are busy I'm going to the restaurants, they're going out to dinner. I might not answer your question, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, no, I think it's a beautiful thing, and I think that's something we need. Well, the only city council member you mentioned was Sarah. Your favorite city council member is in Japan. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> yes, my mother-in-law. She was the first uh, city, female city councilor in Kyoto. Really? Wow. Yeah. Funny, I was joking, and you were. Uh, so we have time for a couple more questions. Um, yeah, Sarah, go ahead. So we're about out of time. If you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Sure. <clears throat> so thanks again for having us, having me here. Um, thanks for your volunteerism. Uh, I know you're coming out here, you're not getting paid. Uh, I'm here again, I'm not a politician. Um, uh, I'm not a civic activist, so I'm not a business. I'm an entrepreneur, and I think that is what this city needs, and it's crazy as it might sound. I think the city council needs somebody on the council to balance it out, and that's why I'm running. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much.